Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to episode 300 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Wow, we're here. Episode 300. That's a lot of podcast episodes. So how do we mark this achievement that so few podcasts will ever reach? That's a serious question. It's a question that I posed to my teammates on the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team, and they had an exciting and interesting idea. You see, today marks not only our 300th episode, but its release date, April 13, 2021, marks my 40th birthday. Yes, I've made the top of the hill, and now I can begin my descent down it. So Joe, Martha, Holly, and Karen, my teammates, thought we should celebrate by asking 40 different historians what they wish more people better understood about early American history. So that's exactly what we did. Actually, we asked more than 40 scholars and received about 37 responses in return. So today's celebratory 300th episode is in two parts. First, we'll enjoy a short conversation with Karen Wolf, my digital audio teammate and the executive director of the Omohundro Institute. Together, we'll explore some of the behind the scenes of the podcast and what historians of early America mean when they use the term vast early America. Then, after Karen tells us what she wishes more people better understood about early American history and why, we'll hear from 35 scholars about what they wish people better understood. But first, thank you. Thank you for coming on this journey with me and the Omohundro Institute over the last 300 episodes. It's been a lot of fun. And I sincerely appreciate all of the time you've spent with us, all the feedback you've sent me via email or social media, or brought to me and told me in person at one of our meetups, and all you do to share this podcast with others. I really enjoy spending time with you and exploring history with you, and I can't wait for the next 300 episodes. Now, producing 300 episodes has taken a lot of time and work. The digital audio team and I really do invest at least an hour of labor into each minute you hear. Plus, consuming a podcast may be free, but producing a podcast is decidedly not free. It requires a fair bit of money to pay the team for its labors, plus to support hosting and engineering costs. Now, you can help support these costs by joining the Ben Franklin's World subscription program and becoming a subscriber. It's quick and easy to become a subscriber. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Okay, are you ready to celebrate like it's episode 300? Let's get this party started. Well, Karen, if you can believe it, Ben Franklin's world has now reached episode 300. And as well into its six-year production, we've been publishing episodes for the last six and a half years now. And Ben Franklin's World is in its fifth year of partnership with the Omohundro Institute. Do you remember the first email I sent you all those years ago asking for some guidance on running a history publication? Well, first of all, congratulations, Liz, on the big 300. That's amazing. I know it also comes on the big 4-0, so two congratulations there. Very exciting on both. Great achievement. And yes, of course, I remember that email. And I also remember our conversation because I was in my car driving, which is where I used to have all my conversations before the pandemic. So I remember it very well. I remember chatting about how you were starting this podcast and wanting to talk about how history communication was changing. Yeah. And I think for me, the biggest point in that email was I really needed to know how to tell my colleagues no politely because I had started the podcast and it took off really quickly. I mean, We went from 288 downloads in our first month of release in October 2014 to averaging 25 or 26,000 downloads by January 2015. So it was a hobby. And then all of a sudden it felt like you were like, no, Liz, what you have is a professional publication and you need to treat it that way. And I was like, 
well, that's great, Karen, but I have no idea how to do that. (laughs) Well, I'm glad to have been of help and I'm glad that the OI has been a good partner in that. Yeah. And speaking of our partnership with the OI, as I mentioned, you know, we've been partnering since 2016 when we released the first season of Doing History. And then in 2017, Ben Franklin's World became a full-time publication of the Omohundro Institute. So I'm wondering if you can reflect a bit on the partnership between Ben Franklin's World and the OI and, you know, how the production of the podcast has really come to fit within the larger work of the OI. Yeah, that's a great question. So the OI is, you know, almost 80 years old now, and for all of that time has been focused on supporting scholars and scholarship for the public good. That is, how can we do the best early American history possible? And how can we share that most widely? And, you know, for most of the life of the Institute, that's been in a fairly traditional vein of publishing. We publish field-leading journal, the William & Mary Quarterly, And we publish an excellent and hyper award winning book series with our partners at the University of North Carolina Press, do conferences, many convenings a year. But just as you and I were starting to have these conversations, or actually the year before in 2014, the OI had a very generous gift from our board member, Sid Lapidus, to establish the Lapidus Initiative. And that project really helped us to drill down on digital platforms and on thinking about new media forms for history. And I think Ben Franklin's World has been a perfect kind of production to fit within that initiative. We've got lots of different digital projects that we've been experimenting with and lots of scholars working in digital forms that we have been supporting. And certainly working in audio has been a really important part of that. Could you tell us a little bit about the other digital projects the OI has added before and since Ben Franklin's World? Yeah, so I think the thing we started working on right away was an app for the journal. So a journal publication, you know, back in the day, the William Mary Quarterly has actually been published since 1893, was published in what I still think of as the best tech, which is paper. And then very late in the 20th century began as a digital publication through some of the big online aggregators like JSTOR, Journal Storage. In fact, the quarterly was one of the first 10 journals in JSTOR. And we had a pretty robust digital presence for the journal and more and more our book publications as well. But we were really looking for a new way to integrate digital humanities scholarship into the journal and to be able to convey how digital modes of research and also digital modes of explanation could be a journal article, could be scholarship in a conventional understanding of research that furthers knowledge. So we developed an app actually with the support of Adobe Systems. And that was the first big digital project that we undertook. And the app, which is now in a 2.0, and you can read it at oireader.wm.edu. That was a super big deal for us. And that was pretty exciting. So that was probably the first big digital initiative. We've also hosted digital projects. You can find Colonial Virginia Portraits, for example. We'll soon be launching Song History. But we've also funded a group of pretty exciting and innovative collaborative digital archival projects through the Lapidus Initiative as well. So this is just a sample of some of the digital work that we've been doing. New media forms, new ways of supporting advances in scholarship. And what excites you most about new media in terms of getting the word out about early American history or doing the work of early American history? There are two dimensions to that. One is that scholars are working in different ways. Scholars are working in different media forms. So scholars are doing their research in different ways and they're conveying their research findings in different ways. They're doing GIS mapping. They're doing network analysis. They're doing deep kind of coding and big data work. And we need new structures to be able to share that. So that's important. We need actually new formats for the new kinds of scholarship that's being undertaken. But I also think it's true that as we publish online and as we have audio reach, we're able to bring public audiences more and more into our work. Another project that I would mention is our partnership with the American Antiquarian Society to relaunch Commonplace, one of the first really online publications in early American history. It was founded in 2000, and we relaunched it last year. 
pretty exciting. And we're excited about the future of that as well. So new kinds of scholarship needs new platforms. And also these online platforms and audio forms help us reach the public in exciting ways. And I think one of the exciting things that we've been able to do with Ben Franklin's world since partnering with the OI is interact with these new mediums, right? During our first two seasons of doing history, we had presence on the OI Reader app, and we're now building a second presence on the OI Reader app 2.0, or the OI Reader is just what we're calling it now. Yep. Multimedia platforms is, I know, one of your favorite phrases, and I think that's definitely true. We've got a lot of cross-platform work now, and that's fantastic because it helps us not just to reach more people, but it also helps us reach people in different ways. You know, people digest information differently. Some people like to hear, some people like to read, some people like to watch, some people like me, like all of the above. I always like that answer, D, all of the above. So yeah, I think that's been really great, incorporating information from Ben Franklin's world into the app and also, you know, profiling books and things on the podcast. Now, I have to know because we are at episode 300 and we've worked together for over five years now. So Do you have a favorite podcast moment over the last 300 episodes or perhaps even a favorite episode? Oh, I could never say that. No, 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 no. They're all my favorite. I like them all. And that's actually true. I do. I do appreciate them all. I think I'm especially proud of the Doing History series. You know, we've worked really hard to develop this series that looks at how history is actually done and helps explain how history is done. So, you know, I still have an enormous fondness for doing History One, How Historians Work, because that's, I think, a powerful series. And I think it's appropriate for so many different levels of students and teachers, especially. So I guess I'm going to have to go with doing History One, but I love them all. For me, it's always a case of what's my favorite shifts over time as we do something new and exciting. Like right now, I'm still really high on the World of the Wampanoag series that we did at the end of 2020 because... You know, that was our real big first foray into narrative podcasting. Like we'd done a couple test runs earlier in 2020, but we were able to pull it all together with music and narration and dynamic storytelling. And I guess that's what I'm most excited about right now. That's a really special series. There's no doubt about that. That's a special series. It's also, although we'd collaborated in, you know, deep ways on pretty much all of the series, that's the first one we actually said, okay, we were actually co-writing this one. So that's fun too. Yeah, we co-wrote that and Mass Humanities helped us. It it was a really great series. Now, I'd like for us to talk about the idea that you've coined as vast early America. Because when I started Ben Franklin's World, my goal was to create a podcast that talked about the long 18th century, which Ben Franklin's life pretty much spanned. And I wanted to do so with an expansive view. You know, I grew up in New England, so I learned about early American history first through Plymouth, then through Jamestown. That's the order here in New England. Plymouth first, Jamestown second. And that was kind of my my conception of early American history. But then I went to grad school in California and all of a sudden, you know, California has an early American history, but it doesn't start with Jamestown and Plymouth. If you really want to get at early American history, then you need to start much earlier with Native American civilizations like the Nahuatl peoples and the Maya. And then, you know, of course, they bring in Spanish conquests. So it's an early American past. It's just very different than the one we grew up learning about on the East Coast. So that was kind of my goal is I wanted to have this podcast that talked about early America in very expansive ways. And then in 2015, 2016, you coined this term and this hashtag vast early America, which I also think wants to take a wide view of early American history. So I wonder if you could tell us about the idea of vast early America, the development of the phrase and what you hope to accomplish by coining this term. Well, I think in the beginning, it was just descriptive. That is, this is what the scholarship has been showing us increasingly, is we just have early American scholarship that focuses West, Southwest, Northwest, across North America, the Atlantic world, very importantly, the Caribbean. Vast Early America was really describing what scholars were doing with early American history. So, you know, as a kind of origin moment, I think it was really meant to be descriptive. And it's not just a geographical observation. It's also about chronology, because I think early American history can sort of run like, you know, sand in a glass tipped over towards the revolutionary period and towards a kind of explanation of how the American nation comes to be. But early American history is much deeper 
than that and has a much longer chronology than that. So vast early America is geographical. It is chronological. It's also about the people of early America. When we think about early American history, I think it can be too easy to think about guys in white wigs. But if we think about who's actually living in early America is profoundly native place. There is a significant and growing population of African descended and African people who are enslaved. And it is a polyglot of European settlers. So vast early America is geographical, it's chronological, it's demographic, and also it's methodological. Because in the last two decades, scholars have been doing really exciting work with new methods of approaching the early American past. So vast early America tries to incorporate all of that expansiveness, all of that complexity, all of that enormous potential in explaining the early American past. You know, you've written a lot about vast early America for publications like the National Endowment of the Humanities magazine and other places. And I think at one point I read that you said at minimum, you really need to know at least 400 years of history, four different continents worth of history and many different cultures worth of history to really be a scholar of early America. Yes. Well, my graduate students who are taking field exams will say that vast early America is not a it's not a field that you can really comprehend you know, one could study and really comprehend the scholarship on slices of the early American past. But I think just that observation itself is important. That is, when we say, I am a scholar of, if you say, I'm a scholar of early America, you're really claiming a lot. And I am not a research scholar of vast early America. My research focuses on British America in the 18th century. That's the thing I know. My colleague Fabricio Prado is not a scholar of early America. He is a scholar of South America and the Spanish Caribbean. And, you know, my colleague, Josh Piker, is not a historian of early America. He's a historian, a research scholar of Native American history, particularly in the Native Southeast. So I think part of what vast early America asks us to do is to specify the early America where we really have expertise. That's quite important. I can be a generalist, and I certainly teach vast early America. I speak about it a lot. I travel around and chat with people about it a lot. But as a scholar, as a research specialty, no, I'm not a research specialist in vast early America. I think anyone who suggests that they are is, I don't know, having something better for breakfast than I've had. On this point, I wonder if you could discuss what it means to study vast early America. Well, I think there are kind of two dimensions here. One is thinking about how vast early America differs maybe from what you were talking about as the traditional East Coast British American focus of your childhood histories. And the other is what it really means for United States history. So the first I've already talked about, that is just thinking about early America, just in having a more capacious understanding of early America. The other is how it relates to the history of the United States, because, you know, you just referenced vast early America as kind of 400 years and four continents of history. And not all of those places became the United States. So how does early America relate to the United States? There had been a relatively straightforward answer to that, which is if you focus on the 13 British colonies in North America, you can make an argument about how those develop into the United States. Those are the colonies that revolted against British rule and that established the United States during the American Revolution. But how those 13 colonies and how the rest of the territory that becomes the United States relate is somewhat more complicated. A traditional historical trajectory is to move from east to west as the United States claims or conquers or acquires more territory, and to explain those places in the context of their becoming part of the United States. So we move to let's say, with the Louisiana Purchase, the vast territory along the Mississippi River in the early 19th century, and then further west and so on with the acquisition of states, well, territories, and then becoming states in the mid and then later 19th century. And I think there are kind of two problems with that. The first is that those places, whether it's California, where you went to graduate school, or Colorado, where my mom grew up, 
or Seattle, where my sister lives, those places have an early American past too. And they're no less relevant to our understanding as Americans now than Boston at the moment of the Tea Party, for example. Those places have an early American past that as Americans, as citizens of this nation, we ought to understand. And those histories of those places, again, they're profoundly Native histories. And those are histories that are much more complex than simply becoming American territories and then states might suggest. So that's one point about how thinking about this broader context for the history of the United States and a broader early America pertains. The second is simply that the continental United States and even the United States plus Alaska and Hawaii simply is situated within a much wider world right from the beginning. So even if you start with the 13 colonies of British America, those were not the only British colonies, <laughs> even in their particular region. The Caribbean is profoundly important and a reasonable argument is the Caribbean colonies are more important to the British Empire than the North American colonies were for a long time and for really critical reasons. And the Caribbean really tells us a lot about how the British colonies on the East Coast and then the United States come to be, in particular, deeply rooted in the histories of slavery and also of native dispossession. So one is you can't just talk about places and their histories once they become part of the United States. The second is that even when you look at the East Coast and those 13 colonies, you have to see them in a wider context in which they were understood at the time. Well, we've talked about history and how you can be a generalist in the history of Australia America, but you wouldn't really be a research scholar in the history of Australia America, although you might deal with aspects of Australia American history in your research to really be a specialist and to really understand this capacious view of history, well, that would be a really difficult task. So now I wonder, Karen, with all the scholarly specialization within the field of Australia America, what do you think are the most exciting developments that you've seen in the study of early American history? Well, I think arguably in the last two decades, I would say methodologically and also just in terms of just more information that we know and understand scholars of slavery and enslaved people and scholars of Native American people and indigenous perspectives have really just lit up the field. Extraordinarily enlightening, important work that's really expanded and changed our understanding. Now, as you know, we're celebrating episode 300 and my 40th birthday by asking nearly 40 scholars what they wished more people better understood about the history of Vasterly America and why they wish more people had that better understanding. So Karen, would you kick off this exploration by telling us what you wish people better understood about the history of early America and why you wish they had that better understanding? How long are you letting people talk for this, Liz? <laughs> I could go on for quite a while on this question. I would say if I had to choose one thing, that I wish more people better understood. It's not really a time or a place or an event. It's actually the process of historical discovery. Because I think too often people dismiss revisionism as some kind of either nefarious or frivolous activity when actually revisionism is the heart of all knowledge inquiry, whether it's science or the humanities or history or whatever. We understand better by revising what we know. And as historians, we revise because we have new information. So whether those are new archives coming online, digitized sources, for example, whether they're newly discovered materials, we revise with new methods. We have methods of exploring the same materials differently. And we revise with new perspectives. And that comes from all kinds of sources of information. I think that comes from different people, a diversity of voices and a diversity of scholars working in the field. So new information, new methods, new perspectives, this revises our understanding profoundly. And it's an important, exciting and extremely valuable process for history, just as it is for science. We would have no vaccine right now for the pandemic that we are experiencing without revision in scientific discovery and in biomedical research. So it's the same for history. I wish people understood that and embraced it. 
I believe they will. I believe more are. Well, Karen Wolf, thank you so much for all the advice that you've given me and for all the support that you've shown for this podcast. And thank you for helping us kick off our 300th episode. Thanks, Liz. Congratulations again. Now that we've heard from Karen and better understand what scholars mean when they talk about vast early America, let's hear what more than 30 other scholars have to say about what they wish more people better understood about early American history and why they wish people had that better understanding. Now, before we begin, just a quick note about process. All of the scholars you will hear from today, you've heard from before. They're all past or future guests of Ben Franklin's world. Also, Unlike most of our conversations where I'll sit down with a guest and record us in a virtual recording space, I asked the scholars in this episode to call and leave us a voicemail through an app. So the audio quality does vary a bit, but all the answers are very interesting and very short. Each scholar was asked to tell us what they think in 60 seconds or less, and no scholar received more than 90 seconds to tell us their answer. So with that, here are 35 scholars answering the question. What do you wish more people better understood about early American history? And why do you wish they had that better understanding? Hi, this is Caitlin Fitz from Northwestern. Happy 300th episode. Happy 40th birthday, Liz. Here's what I wish more people understood about the early United States. That by its 50th birthday in 1826, the U.S. was the only American republic in which slavery was growing rather than receding. Haiti ended slavery with independence in 1804. Then over the 1810s and 20s, the entire Spanish-American mainland, so everything from Mexico to Chile, secured its independence from Spain. And as a matter of military and political exigency, these newest American republics began to implement various anti-slavery policies and profess an ostensibly multiracial nationalism. The only other places where slavery was expanding so fast were colonial Cuba and the newly independent monarchy of Brazil. So that's why by the mid-1820s, the U.S. was the only American republic in which slavery was growing. As abolitionists in the U.S. and throughout the Americas noted, it was a really unenviable form of American exceptionalism. My name is Brett Rushforth, and I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Oregon. The aspect of early American history that I wish people better understood was the importance of Native American slavery. I think we understand that Native people were dispossessed by the colonial project and that disease and pandemics played an important role in that. But we haven't yet fully reckoned with the importance of enslaving Native people to the European colonization of the Americas. Between 1492 and mid-19th century, about 5 million Native people were enslaved by Europeans and forced to work in their colonies. From Brazil to Canada and everything in between, enslaved Native people played an important role in the economic, political, and diplomatic life of the colony. And millions of enslaved Native people experienced colonialism in this very particular way that we have yet to fully understand. So I think it's important that we integrate this into the story of Atlantic slavery and into the story of colonial America and vast early America. My name is Carolyn Winterer, and I teach American history at Stanford University. I wish more people knew how hard it is to get evidence about the past. Sure, we know a lot about early American history. We know some of the causes and consequences of the American Revolution, for example. But I wish more people knew how much of the historical record lies beyond our reach. Not only does a lot get lost because of the passage of time, but we also don't agree on how to interpret the scraps of evidence we do have. And the further back in time we go, whether it's 1776 or 1619 or the year 20,000 BC, the earliest American history, the more of the historical record we lose, along with fundamental aspects of the human experience. We all need to be humble to be historians, whether of early America or any other time period. Marcus P. Nebius. What is one aspect of early American history I wish people better understood and why? As we acknowledge Black History Month in 2021, we should also acknowledge that the January 6th mob that assaulted the United States Capitol building tapped into a deeply ingrained politics of racial hatred. Like the history of slavery, the politics of racial hatred form a foundational thread of United States history. Reactionary by nature, 
Such politics target efforts to bring about a more equitable and just America. They are a direct response to a black radical protest tradition, given voice in the commentaries of David Walker, Mariah Stewart, William Cooper Nell, Frederick Douglass, and many others that departs sharply from mainstream American political thought. Instead of the new United States cast as a land of freedom and independence, Black Americans' counter-narrative highlighted the problem of persistent protections for slavery as the central legacy of United States republicanism. This aspect of early American history is deeply researched, widely cited, and should be better understood in the public space of historical ideas. My name is Josh Piker. The one aspect of early American history that I wish people better understood is that even when early Americans use categories and terms that sound familiar to us today, we can't assume that they're using those categories and terms in the same way that we do. Early American history is full of terms that we recognize, descriptions of people as black or white, references to husbands and wives, nations and empires, bodily sensations and emotions. It's so tempting to assume that we understand what early Americans meant when they described their world with these terms that we use today. And sometimes we do, but sometimes, much more often than we think, our categories don't quite work in early America. And one of the real joys of doing early American history comes from being attentive to those moments of close but not quite, and then seeking to explain how we move from their understanding and their terms to ours. If we're not open to that process of transition and transformation, we'll fail to understand both their world and ours. This is Lisa Wilson. I'm the Charles G. McCurdy Professor Emeritus of American History at Connecticut College. Early American history, to me, is so much more than simply 13 colonies in 1776. Early American history includes everything, from ancient indigenous history to the period before the Civil War. The stories are Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic, Caribbean, and more. Like our present day, dominated by the World Wide Web, early America was a time of movement and connection. These are the real stories of our nation, and our continent, and of the world. Our scholarship is broad beyond any other field of American history. It is one of the most vibrant, diverse, and complex periods of our past. These are the stories that explain how we arrived to our present moment. They are foundational. Hi, this is Sarah Giorgini, series editor for the Papers of John Adams, part of the Adams Papers editorial project, based at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. When we listen to the soundtrack of early America, I hope we'll investigate a little more fully the concept of religion. For many in this period, Christianity and notions of Christian citizenship laid out duties for people to fulfill. That didn't mean that they wholly understood or kept to the religion that they heard in institutions or from the pulpit. Rather, theology supplied them with an intellectual framework. And from there, they thought, what is it good for? What can I do with religion? And in critical moments in early American history, in that period that stretches from the Declaration to Disunion, Religion is always present in our stories about social change, whether it's colonial settlement, the American Revolution, the Civil War, even jumping ahead a little to the dawn of modern mass culture. People turn to religion to make sense of new social norms, to guide American diplomacy, and to adapt Christian ethics for civic duty. So we need to listen as carefully as we can when religion crops up in our history. Hi, my name is Kenneth Cohen, and I'm a historian at the University of Delaware and the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. One aspect of early American history that I wish people better understood is that life was at least as complicated back then as it is now. People from all backgrounds juggled enormous changes with inherited traditions, and they felt conflicted and exhausted by that. Debt stressed out most people, even the wealthy. Whether enslaved or free, people striving for greater personal or even national independence found themselves dependent on others or, of course, subordinated by law. So there was a tension between independence and dependence that certainly varied by race and gender, but was present in most people's lives to some degree. I think remembering that early Americans were human beings living complicated lives under difficult circumstances 
can help us learn more from them about how to live our lives in a difficult time, and frankly, also how not to live our lives, than if we put them on pedestals or imagine them as simpler people living in a simpler time. My name is Bonnie Huskins, and I teach history at St. Thomas University and the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, Canada. I'd like to know more about how the loyalists of the American Revolution negotiated the revolution. I'm specifically interested in those who returned home from exile. How were they and their families received? What of the majority of loyalists who never left the American colonies? How were they able to negotiate a coexistence with their former enemies? What does this tell us about the process of peacemaking in the United States? Lastly, I'm interested in how families and women particularly negotiated the revolution. I'd like to know more about women like Jane Bartram of Pennsylvania, who did not follow her loyalist husband into exile, instead petitioning for separation and articulating her own political identity as a supporter of the revolution. How many Janes are out there in the records waiting to be discovered? Hi, I'm Johan Neem, and I teach at Western Washington University. One of the things that I wish every American understood about the early American Republic is that the idea of the self-made man is a myth. No person can make themselves. We are all dependent, and our independence is the product of our interdependence. In the so-called age of the self-made man, women and men and girls and boys depended on institutions for self-making. This included households, but extended beyond to encompass churches and schools, voluntary associations and cultural organizations, businesses and government. At the heart of the American experiment are institutions, and American individualism was produced through these institutions. It is up to us to maintain the health of our institutions. Hi, I'm Jennifer Van Horn, Associate Professor of Art History and History at the University of Delaware, and the author of The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America. I wish people better understood enslaved people's relationship with art in early American history. Scholars have uncovered Black people's creativity as makers of material objects, but we're just beginning to uncover how enslaved people were involved with portraiture, the most common type of artwork in early America. We can think of Prince Dima, whose enslavers brought him to London to train briefly in a painter's studio, and then returned him to Boston, where Dima created portraits for patrons despite being enslaved. We can think of enslaved viewers of artworks, elite households where enslaved people labored were also sites where portraits were displayed. Though intended to highlight white elite sitters' status, enslaved viewers made their own meanings. As one Black author noted, no one could prevent us making use of our eyes. When we look at the many surviving portraits from early America, I invite us to see them as products of both enslaved labor and images that shaped Black people's visual worlds. Annette Gordon-Reed, I wish people better understood that things could have been different in the past. People make choices that determine how the circumstances of their lives will proceed, and nothing is inevitable. We tend to work our way back to things that happened in the past and assume that they did have to happen. But people had choices. And I think as important about this is that it suggests that we can make choices. There's nothing inevitable about the way things turn out for us. We have a hand in our future. And I think in that way, the past can teach us something. Contingency, the lack of inevitability, all of these things matter. Stephen Freed, the aspect of American history I wish people better understood was race relations in Philadelphia when it was the nation's capital during the 1790s. I think this is the key to understanding the very beginnings, not only of America's challenges with slavery, but America's challenges with racial prejudice against free blacks. And so the creation of the first black churches by Absalom Jones and Richard Allen with the help of Benjamin Rush, but many other racial issues during this time, which I really think are key. I see them interpreted lots of different ways, sometimes without access to all the original writings. And I just wish we would spend some time paying attention to everything we know about this time and trying to find out more about this time to look at the issues of how free blacks and white people in Philadelphia and across the country got along and talked about racial prejudice, because it's a key thing, and it's a key thing today. Hi, this is Holly White, 
One aspect of early American history that I wish people better understood is how early American legal definitions of age, ability, and maturity did not reflect lived experience. Social and cultural beliefs about race, class, and gender determined whether a young person was actually considered a child and protected as such, regardless of their age. Although on paper, anyone under the age of 21 or 18 was considered a legal child, the vast majority did not reap the benefit from this legal distinction. Age laws used to define culpability and capability were designed to protect elite white youth. They were meant to shield white children from criminal responsibility, as well as limit their ability to disrupt family expectations regarding marriage or inheritance. In turn, these same laws were manipulated to exploit and punish children of color either by justifying enslavement and perpetual servitude or imposing prison terms and death sentences for the same crimes white children committed but walked free from. By understanding the early American origins of these laws, we would better recognize the flaws of modern-day age laws as well as the biases that circulate in our justice system as it operates today. Hello, my name is Alejandra Lukowski, and I'm an associate professor of history at UC Riverside. One aspect of early American history that I wish people better understood is how vast the geographical scope and how long the chronological arc of early America really is. And the reason I would want them to know that is not just because when you see how broad early America is, you get to hear all these other voices and stories that you otherwise wouldn't get to hear. It's because when we think about how long the chronological arc is and how vast the geographical spread is, we begin to shift our understanding about what voices we get to hear, about what stories really matter, and who counts when we think about the past. And to me, when we shift that, we begin to see an early American world that is not only more fascinating, but that speaks to our history right now. Historical events aren't foregone conclusions. There are an infinite number of paths that historical actors can take. We study institutions like the Continental and Confederation Congresses to understand what those delegates did and how and why they did it. It's those decision-making processes that provide a lasting value for us today. Terrence Rucker. Hi, this is Zara Annis Hanslin, and one aspect of early American history I wish people better understood is that April 13th is not just Thomas Jefferson's birthday, it's also Liz Covart's. Happy birthday, Liz. More seriously, though, this does segue perfectly into the point I want to make, which is that I really wish that people better understood that early America was peopled by women, Black, Indigenous, White, Asian, mixed race, just as much as men, and that early American history is better when it is peopled by women as well, when they are folded into the narrative rather than pushed to the side and told as the story of just a few exceptional women, that people would recognize that women in all their complex, diverse roles shaped early America. They weren't just wives, mothers, and daughters, and sisters. They were merchants, poets, rulers, shopkeepers, enslavers, inventors, farmers, architects, preachers, artists, teachers, diplomats, politicians, soldiers, financiers, inventors, historians, printers, and revolutionaries. And why is this important? Because it better reflects the true history of early America, and true history is always more interesting than the alternative. And because recognizing the importance of women in the past makes it easier to acknowledge the importance of women in America today. Hello, my name is Jessica Marie Johnson, and I am an assistant professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. I wish people had a better understanding of the way that race operates and its history. I think that there are conversations about race and Blackness that tend to sort of treat, you know, Blackness or Africanness as this pebble that you pick up on one side of the Atlantic and you drop on the other. <laughs> and I think it's so important that we see and have a better understanding in that seeing the complexity of African identity, of African ethnicity, of African polities and social formations, that we have a better understanding of how those things change shape over time and space, of their malleability and dynamism, not just how static they might be. And if we have a better sense of what it means to become African-American, to become Afro-Caribbean, to become Black on the other side of the Atlantic, I think that that would actually really reshape a lot of how we understand the rise of colonial institutions, 
the rise and fall of the plantation complex, the different kinds of resistances that people engaged in, Black and otherwise, and the emergence of various wars, like even the Civil War. Hello, my name's Andrew O'Shaughnessy. I'm a vice president of Monticello and a professor at the University of Virginia. I've chosen as my topic the controversial issue of religion and the founding of the United States. Thomas Jefferson, assisted by James Madison, was responsible for the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, which has historically played a major role in the interpretation of the clause on religion in the First Amendment and the division between church and state. Jefferson and Madison always favored speaking of religious freedom rather than just religious toleration. The subsequent debate is largely focused upon the extent of what Jefferson called a wall of separation. His views about the extent of the separation are clear from his creation of the University of Virginia, about which I've just completed a book to be published in August, entitled The Illimitable Freedom of the Human Mind, Thomas Jefferson's Idea of a University. Because it was a public university, Jefferson insisted that it should have no chapel and no department of theology. Although he seemed to be agreeable to a room where students might privately worship, he effectively prevented the availability of such a space during his lifetime. The university was at the time the only secular university in the United States. Hi, I'm Julie Reed, an associate professor of history at Penn State University and a Cherokee Nation citizen. I wish people better understood that the historical arc of Indian removal is longer, deeper, and geographically wider. Even with the familiar Cherokees, there's more to know. We need to say more names than John Ross. We need to understand the revolutionary era Chickamauga-led internal reorganizations to appreciate the decades-long pressures Cherokees faced. We need to understand that Jefferson, before Jackson, promoted voluntary removal. We need to remember that in the midst of deep Cherokee political divides, an old warrior named the Glass, living in Arkansas, became literate in Cherokee syllabary as a result of the efforts of a little girl named Ayoka, who aided her father's syllabic invention. We have yet to learn the names of nearly enough enslaved people also hurt by removal, even though badass women scholars had given us a strong foundation to do so. We need to remember this is not simply a Southern or Five Tribes story. We need to continue following the money. We need to remember not everyone removed. Longer, deeper, wider. I'm Ronald Angelo Johnson, the Ralph and Bessie Millen Chair of History at Baylor University. I wish people better understood the relationships between Americans and the citizens of Haiti. During the Haitian Revolution from 1789 to 1804, though many white Americans feared the Black Rebellion that overthrew slavery in Haiti, others, including President John Adams, endorsed the dawn of Black Atlantic freedom. From 1804 to 1862, the U.S. government refused to recognize an independent government in Haiti. Still, Black and white Americans worked relentlessly to advocate for the Haitian government and to ally with the Haitian population. The transracial relationships between early Haitians and Americans are instructive for 21st century relationships. Their early relationships were complex and resilient. They teach us to remain resilient as we address present problems created by our imperfect past. I'm Kathy Kelly, and the thing I wish more people knew about early America is that it isn't subtle. It changes all the time. Of course, I don't mean that key facts change. The Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, and however long we study the revolution, that date isn't likely to move. But how we understand these key facts, the stories we tell about them, the meaning we find in them, those things evolve. Indeed, the kind of evidence that qualifies as a key fact evolves. The early America I study today isn't the early America that I studied in college, and that's a good thing. Early America is both a place fixed in space and time and a set of urgent and ongoing debates about the meaning of our past, debates that play out among scholars, educators, curators, politicians, and the public. And it is that tension that allows the past to surprise us, to instruct us, and to inspire us. Hi, this is Martha Howard. I'm the Associate Director of Programs for the Omohundro Institute. What I want people to know about early American history is that historical scholarship, in fact, all 
scholarship really never happens in a vacuum. And that what you're hearing on those episodes of Ben Franklin's world when scholars are speaking is really part of a much larger ongoing conversation that the individuals speaking are not only working on their own scholarship, they're serving as expert reviewers of other people's scholarship, they're teaching, they're maybe writing reviews, they are maybe editing journals, they're doing any number of things, all of which contribute to a larger body of knowledge and ongoing conversation and ongoing body of work that makes up what we know at any given time and that that work is something that requires quite a bit of dedication as well as a team effort. So I commend all the people who play on that team and hope we get to hear lots more of them. Hello, I'm uh, Stephen Bromwell, an independent historian based in Amsterdam. With the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War getting ever closer, I'd like to see a greater appreciation of the extent to which that conflict was not just a rebellion against imperial tyranny, but also a genuine civil war within the British Empire. Focusing on 1775, it's all too easy to forget that just 12 years before, in 1763, Britain and her North American colonies had celebrated a stunning joint victory over their old enemy, France. Many men who had become heroes of the Patriot cause, such as George Washington, had served military apprenticeships in that earlier war, fighting alongside the Redcoats. By recognising the reality of a civil war, we gained a better understanding of what motivated individuals when it came to choosing sides, or in the case of the revolution's most infamous traitor, changing them. Benedict Arnold always maintained that he turned his coat to end a fratricidal conflict and to reconcile King George's subjects on both sides of the Atlantic. A very happy birthday to Ben Franklin's world and to its creator, Dr. Liz Covart. I'm Joyce Chaplin, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to state what aspect of early American history I wish people better understood. That aspect is environmental history, including climate history, energy history, animal history, and oceanic history, meaning all aspects of the non-human material world that aren't standard parts of early American history, but should be. I'd want people to understand environment and climate not as extra or competing parts of early American history. They're not extra or competing. They're deeply connected to the field's central themes of colonization and resistance, conflicts over natural resources, especially land, and imperialism's racist and unequal distribution of wealth and health are, after all, unresolved problems in the Americas, including the United States. More people need to understand the history of those problems. My name is Tyson Reeder, and I'm an affiliated assistant professor of history at the University of Virginia and an editor with the papers of James Madison. One aspect of early American history that I wish people better understood is the founding period, and particularly the creation, ratification, and implementation of the Constitution, which may sound odd because that's a part of early American history that many people have at least some working knowledge of. In today's political climate, however, people all along the political spectrum have marshaled the framers to their side as if the framers would uniformly support them or as if the founding history, as we may call it, provides clear-cut answers to today's issues. I'm of a firm opinion that history, especially the history of the Constitution, lends important perspective to challenges we face today, but perspective is not prescription. When we act as if history supports our own partisanship, we misuse the study of history and weaken civil discourse. My name is Dinah Ramey Berry, and I'm the chair of the history department at the University of Texas at Austin. People of African descent were both free and enslaved in early America, and they too fought for justice and equality in a variety of ways. Although literal and legal shackles bound them to second-class status, Many saw themselves as contributors to our great nation, and their desire was to create a space for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hi, I'm Joe Edelman. I'm Associate Professor of History at Framingham State and Assistant Editor for Digital Initiatives at the OI. One aspect of early American history that I wish people understood better is that there's no such thing as the founders, and that group of people that we think of didn't agree on everything. So often in American popular culture, people talk about the founders as if there's some monolithic group of people who wisely sat in Philadelphia distributing perfect compacts and laws, and that's just not so. 
the group of people we use that term for were politicians, no more or less wise than any other generation, though they lived at a pretty fortunate moment for themselves to have an impact. They argued, they compromised, they produced final documents that reflected those processes. But just as often as a compromise represented some agreed-upon middle ground, another one might represent a last-ditch effort to salvage a plan, or simply reflect that they ran out of time. And yes, this really happened with the Constitution. So we need to talk about the founding era and those guys with more nuance and a little less reverence. Abigail Swingin. The one aspect of early American history that I wish people understood better is that early American history is not an isolated or narrow subject. It's not only the early history of the United States, or even the regions of the world that would eventually become the United States. It's about North and South America, the Caribbean, Central America, and how these regions connected to other parts of the world. It involves the histories of a variety of different people from around the globe, including indigenous Americans, Africans, and Europeans. As a historian of early modern Britain and the Atlantic world, I find that thinking broadly about early American history enhances what I teach and research in all sorts of ways. I could say that one aspect of the past I wish people better understood was the relationship of religion to the so-called American founding. Legal historian Stephen Green talks about twin myths, the conservative myth that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. And the liberal myth that the First Amendment actually built a wall of separation between church and state, as Jefferson said. Well, both of these are wrong, but it takes more than a tweet or a soundbite to unpack why. But rather than this or any other episode, I think the most important aspect that I wish people better understood would be how historians work, how they interpret the past, how it's an ongoing interpretation of arguments built on evidence. It's not like commemoration. That is the present's building of monuments to try to freeze a vision of the past, its vision of the past, for the future. It's almost the opposite of that. How historians work and how to think historically, that's what I wish the broader public knew. This is Heather Cox Richardson. One aspect of early American history I wish people better understood is that water was a highway and land was the barrier in early America. So then they would understand just how cosmopolitan seaports were and how tightly connected early America was to other countries. Hello, I'm Alan Taylor, and I'm very happy to celebrate Liz Covart's Ben Franklin's world, which has made a world of difference for reaching a general audience. And what I would say that I wish a general audience understood better, and which I think they are starting to understand better thanks to Liz's work, is just how long the colonial period is, how it dwarfs the national history of the United States. And I think that we should start early American history with the first colonists who were native peoples who came over perhaps 24,000 years ago, or at least 11,000 years before present. And there's a very dynamic history of change and adaptation in their world. Or if we start with the first European colonists, those would be the Norse who came approximately 1,000 years ago. Or if we are very conventional and say we began in 1492, then there's still two and a half centuries of colonial history, indeed almost three centuries of colonial history before we get to the United States. And it is not uh, sameness to that period, but there are dynamic changes in society and population. So that's what I wish people understood better. My name is Sari Altshuler. I'm an associate professor at Northeastern University in Boston. When thinking about which aspect of early American history I wish people understood better, it would be that people in the past weren't stupid. And I don't think that we generally think this, but especially when it comes to talking about issues, especially in science and medicine, there's a tendency to want to laugh at people's beliefs. And I think this comes out of a place of insecurity. We want to believe that we know so much more now, and we do. But people in the future will also laugh at some of our beliefs. So it would be good if we were a bit more humble and compassionate towards scientific and medical beliefs in the past. And by this, I don't mean that we should be sympathetic to racist, sexist, ableist, homophobic, xenophobic ideas from the past. I actually think that kind of sympathy, which is to say that somehow these were bigoted ideas that were of the time and they should get a pass, I think that that's the flip side of the same issue. That here too, because 
these ideas seem unenlightened, it's fittingly another way of congratulating ourselves on our own progress. This is Erica Armstrong Dunbar. And one aspect about early American history that I wish people better understood is that America was so very African. And when we think about the crops that were grown and harvested, the food that was eaten, the ways in which that food was prepared, the musical instruments carved by hand, the varied religions that were practiced, all of these things shaped early America and has helped me in the framing of its many narratives and really reminds me to always center the lives of people of African descent in this history that we call early America. Hey, Liz, this is Doug Winiorski from the University of Richmond. It's great to be with you again. Here's one thing I wish people better understood about early American history. Religion was a difference maker. What do I mean by this? Well, two things. First, religion mattered to all people in vast early America, whether free or indentured Euro-Americans, enslaved African-Americans, or sovereign Native Americans. Religious institutions, beliefs, and practices shaped their worldviews, work routines, interpersonal relations, politics, laws, economic practices, and private writings. But more than that, religion was a difference maker in that it also differentiated people from one another. Early American religions created divisions, clarified racial categories, fragmented communities, fomented violence, galvanized warfare. We talked about the centrifugal pull of early American evangelicalism in episode 182. My book, Darkness Falls on the Land of Light, was published on Inauguration Day in 2017, and since then, I think, we've learned a lot about the powerful ways religion divides people. Historians of religion in early America have an important role to play in reminding all of us of the potentials and dangers of such difference-making cultural practices. Congratulations on the 300th episode of Ben Franklin's World. I can't wait to see what's ahead. So what do historians wish people better understood about early American history? A whole lot of things. They want us to know that early American history encompasses more than just the history of North America, that it begins before 1492, and that it encompasses the stories and pasts of a wide range of diverse peoples. Scholars of early America also want us to consider the work historians do to produce the histories that we love to read, watch, and listen to. Historical scholarship is by nature collaborative. It can take years to produce, and it changes over time as new presence impact the lenses with which historians view and consider the facts of the past. They also want us to know that early American history is complicated, which is what I think makes it inherently interesting to explore. Now, we've heard from 36 scholars and historians, and I'm our 37th historian. So what do I wish more people better understood about the early American past? I wish more people better understood that early American history and history in general is about people. History tells us how people have acted and how they've changed or not changed over time. In essence, History has the power to tell us who we are and how we came to be who we are. History is often complicated because people are often complicated. And I hope we remember this and work to understand the humanity of the people we read, listen, and talk about. Because the people of the past were once living human beings, just like us. They just lived in a different time period and in a different context. Thank you so much for celebrating the 300th episode of Ben Franklin's World with me. I look forward to investigating more topics and people with you as we move towards episode 400. Now, we had a lot of guests on today's show, and if you'd like to learn more about our guests and perhaps get reacquainted with them through our original conversations, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 300. You'll find a list of everyone with links to their original episodes on the show notes page. Again, that's benfranklinsworld.com slash three, zero, zero. The Omohundro Institute and I could really use your help to keep Ben Franklin's world going. So if you can, please become a subscriber to the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. You can sign up and learn more about the program at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. 
Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, I think it's time to turn the tables. What do you wish more people better understood about early American history? You heard a lot of different answers to this question, and I'm really curious what you think. So please tell me, Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.